Good morning, friends. Welcome to another Bates Botanical Boot Camp webinar. Uh, thank you for joining in this morning. Today's webinar title is Planting for Pollinators 201. Um, last year I did the first one. There's a lot of things I want to add to it. And I thought this would be a good opportunity with everything in bloom to bring this back to the forefront. Uh, so why are pollinators so important? Pollinators preserve and perpetuate biological diversity. We often think of their important role in the food we eat, but the role they play in the future of plant communities and continuing the biological diversity of our natural world cannot be overstated. By and large, plants have evolved to attract pollinators because their future generations depend on them. Plants need insects to transport their pollen to either flowers on the same plant or on a separate plant of the same species. The reward for these pollinators for offering such services is nectar. But our insects have evolved just as dramatically with plant material, not only in the flowers they visit, but in the plants that they can develop on. In a previous webinar, I discussed the importance of host plants and why having a diversity of native plant material in our landscapes ensures that a diversity of insect life is being supported. So just like we need a diversity of plant material to serve as hosts for these insects, we also need to incorporate the same logic by providing a diverse assortment of blooms. We now know that insects pollinate 87.5% of all plants and 90% of flowering plants, thanks to a study published by an ecological scientist named Jeff Ollerton. You may think statistics are a tad on the boring side, but it was this that scientific statistic that opened up the floodgates for more research and gave the movement for pollinator preservation wings. Our future as humans is deeply tied to pollinators. We wouldn't be here without them, and we need to do everything we can to make sure that they have what they need to succeed. So who are these pollinating creatures? Lepidoptera, uh, which would be butterfly and moth species. Butterflies certainly take the center stage when it comes to insects the majority of us humans admire. They are over, there are over 11,500 species of butterflies and moths in North America, and they make up 50% of insect herbivores. This makes them an incredibly important player in pollination. Beetles. Working at Bates has taught me a tremendous amount about insects simply through observation. Uh, so many beetles visit our flowers, and my appreciation for them grows with every season. Bees. Bees are definitely what we all know as pollinators. There are over 4,000 species of native bees in North America, and many also have unique relationships to the pollen of specific flowers. Other pollinators, wasps and ants, flies. I know, no one likes flies, uh, but the next time you curse them under your breath, also remind yourself they play a role of pollinator as well. Thrips. That is the evil bug of the nursery business, but also a pollinator. Birds, yes, this includes our much adored hummingbirds. Bugs, and when we say bugs, like that's a big category and I won't go into detail because I don't know every bug that's out there. Um, but it's kind of like leaf bugs, there's, there's a ton. Termites and cockroaches, ew. Bats and non-flowering mammals, lace wings, not only do lacewings serve as pollinators, but they are also a great predatory insect. Lacewings lay their eggs on plant material that have aphids present, such as milkweed. The eggs hatch and the larvae feed on the aphids, just like lady beetles. Two other pollinators, crickets, and in some parts of the world, lizards. Maybe here, I don't know if our local skinks do much pollination, I bet they do. The world of pollinators is incredibly diverse. In order for us to accommodate for all of these pollinators, we need to provide a diverse selection of blooms. As we can easily observe, flower structure, appearance, color, fragrance, etc., vary from one genus to the next. And what pollinators visit a phlox can be vastly different than what visits Coreopsis or Tixie. We also know that plant species vary in bloom time. There are spring, summer, and fall bloomers, and even a few lone winter bloomers. These flowers cater to the pollinators that are present during these times. It doesn't matter which came first, the chicken or the egg, because these relationships are established now. Our role as gardeners is to simply create gardens that follow nature's design. Having a garden that contains plant material that all bloom at the same time may look good, but only offers a small window to the large group of pollinators that live all around us. Okay, 
We are now going to transition into talking about specific plant material that grows in Middle Tennessee based on the seasons. There's, there is early season, which would, is, and this is going to be loose. Not, it's not from March to May these things bloom. But early season, March, April, May. Mid-season, June, July into August. And late season, August, September, October. Some plants overlap into other seasons, but overall, they'll fit into these groups. Almost all of the plant material I will discuss will be native plant material to the eastern United States and the material we are able to provide here at Bates. Uh, I would also like to be, I will also discuss a little bit about trees, understory trees, shrubs, and vines, along with flowering perennials, um, because their blooms are important throughout the seasons as well. Now I'll touch briefly on annuals, the true candy of the pollinator world. Okay, I'm going to take a quick drink of water. Early, this is going to be a lot of information, just FYI. <laughs> I'll try, I'll try to. And it will be av made available later on our website. Yes, and I'm going to work on making a sheet that's more concise. <laughs> Not with all of my notes. Uh, trees, we're talking about early season. Most native trees bloom in the spring. This is a very important season for early season bees and the emerging pollinators awaking from the winter slumber. Uh, this year, I saw my first swallowtail on April 4th, um, which is way earlier than we really think about butterflies coming out. Um, but some, some butterflies sim uh, overwinter as adults. Some larvae, some pupa stage, and some as eggs. So it's all different. It's very complicated. You don't have to know all that. Just plant pretty things. <laughs> so trees, Acer rubrum, red maple, that is a great early season bloomer for um, bees as well as other wildlife. Liriodendron tul tulipifera, tulip poplar, huge pollen source for a variety of pollinators, including hummingbirds, Prunus serotina, black cherry, Antilia americana, basswood. This, when the basswood's in bloom, bees are all over it. Uh, it's kind of awesome to see. Sometimes we get to witness it if we have one in, in stock at, at Bates when it's in bloom. I would say basswood honey is also very delectable for honeybees that feed off of it. Nice. Understory trees. Aeschylus pavia, red buckeye, attracts hummingbirds in the earlier seasons. Emelanchia or service berry, total bee magnet when it's in bloom. Circus canadensis, eastern redbud, um, super important for early season bees. I hear this talks about a lot, just how important the redbud is to those bees. Uh, the Cornus family, Alternifolia, which is alternate leaf dogwood and flowering dogwood, uh, supports a handful of specialist bees, also attracts butterflies. Carolina Silverbell, flowers attract hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. Prunus Americana, American Plum, or Virginiana, choke cherry. Those are really underused understory trees. They can be out in the sun, um, but with such limited options of what we can grow in shade, they're great as an understory tree, small tree. Uh, Salix discolor, pussy willow, and Salix cerisia, silky willow. Uh, willows are also, it's talked about a lot how important their blooms are in the early season for bees. Um, and I know there's, there's several specialist bees that need blooms of the willow. Shrubs, aronia, there's red chokeberry and black chokeberry. Uh, those definitely attract a lot of bees when they're in bloom, and it's a good uh, early season, but into April, like not, because like we're talking about March, April, May, that's a big group, so it's kind of more in the April, May category of when they bloom. Uh, Father Gia, witch elder, attracts bees and other pollinators, Ilix verticillata, winterberry holly, native bees and other small pollinators gravitate towards these little blooms. Uh, Itea virginica, Virginia sweet spire, attracts bees and other pollinators. Lindera benzoin, spice bush, is talked a lot about. I've talked a lot about it, and I'll talk a bit about it later. Um, great for early season native bees. It's it blooms really early, so it's as they're waking up. That's a great source. Rhododendron, our native deciduous azaleas, uh, early nectar source for hummingbirds and butterflies. And some species bloom later than others, so you can kind of have several, and it'll cover a wider bloom time. Sambucus americana, American elderberry, 
hard to find in the industry. Occasionally we get it in, but it's such a great plant for um, our local bee life and birds and such. Vaccinium, Corium bosum, Vaccinium ashii, those are both blueberries. Great for early season bees, and they bloom at different times. So if you've got several several different types of, of the uh, species, you're doing good. And you'll, you'll see bees all over them. And then Viburnum dentatum, Airwood Viburnum, also a great option. Vines. Um, one vine that blooms pretty early is cross vine, Bignonia. That's great for pollinators. And then early season perennials, Amsonia hubrechtii and Tabernay Montana. Let's see. I have Amsonia in here somewhere. There it is. It's obviously not in bloom. It's already bloomed. If you can see that. One moment, Joe. I'm going to switch to the other camera. Boop. And eee. I need to move it over. I'm over here. So, uh, what is the, <laughs> is there a common name for Amsonia? Blue Star, Arkansas Blue Star. Uh-huh. Okay. Willow Leaf Blue Star. It's coming. Where oh, is it at? Okay. Ta-da. What's really great about this perennial is they have good yellow fall color. Not all perennials going into winter look great, which is fine. Doesn't have to be always attractive, but that one has really attractive yellow fall color. And then that specific one is Starstruck uh, that we sell here. Another one of Tabernay Montana is Stormcloud. And then Hubrechtii is another species. And of that, we sell Butterscotch as a new cultivar. Just supposed to have more intense fall color, from what I understand. Aquilegia canadensis, red columbine, attracts bees and hummingbirds in the early season. It makes a great understory reseeding perennial. Um, Really pretty when it's in bloom. Aruncus or goat's beard. That's a good early season one. Baptisia, Australis. Good for full sun. Uh, many cultivars exist now. Um, I will be talking a little bit about Mount Cuba, which they are a research property. They do trial gardens for um, different genus groups. So they've done Echinacea, Baptisia, Coreopsis, Monarda, Phlox. Um, and their research is super important for our industry because they, they not only look at the performance of the plant in the trial, but also, and they're getting more into who ranks highest of pollinator value, how many visits those pollinators get, or the plants get. So their, their top performers for Baptisia were Screaming Yellow, Lemon Meringue, Purple Smoke, Cherries Jubilee, and Blueberry Sunday. And I think mostly that study was just based on garden performance, but they're all really great for pollinators as well. Pacara aria, ragwort, literally weed. Yes, we sell weeds at Bates. Um, <laughs> it's really good early season. If you are going to plant it, know that it's going to reseed. So give it lots of space. Don't plant it in a very small garden bed because you'll have a lot of it and you'll probably wish you didn't plant it. So it, it has a particular place in the garden. Um, just know when you're planting it. Penstemon digitalis, beard tongue. We sell Huskers Red, Dark Towers, and Black Beard. I don't know that. Oh, there it is. And it's already bloomed. It's kind of one of those April into May bloomers, um, but definitely attracts a lot of pollinators. And this particular one is Black Beard. It's got that dark foliage. All right, and then the last one, Blue Moon, uh, Phlox de Vericata, Woodland Phlox. Blue Moon's the most popular cultivar. Uh, it was naturally found um, by a guy named William Cullina, uh, but it has then just really infiltr infiltrated, it's the wrong word, saturated the market uh, in a very good way because it's a great woodland perennial um, that does well in shade and some sun. <laughs> Okay, on to mid-season, which is June, July, and creeping into August. Trees, Elix opaca, American holly. Um, this is, you barely, rarely see it in the industry, and I hope that that changes because it's such a great holly. Um, it's a native evergreen, which we don't have a ton of, um, so I hope that that really catches on and we see more coming into the market. Um, and when they're in bloom, the bees are everywhere. And side note, when they're in or late winter when the berries are ready, birds are all over it. 
magnolia as a species. There's southern magnolia, big leaf magnolia, sweet bay magnolia. Um, those are great options for the kind of mid-season bloom. Okay, shrubs. Aeschylus parviflora. Bottle brush buckeye attracts hummingbirds and swallowtails. Amorpha, Amorpha fruticosa. Um, we got that in for the first time this year. I'm really excited about it. It's also called false indigo bush. Attracts bees and butterflies. The bloom looks kind of similar to a butterfly bush. Um, deep, dark purple with little yellow tips on the blooms. It's really pretty. Calicarpa americana. American beauty berry. One of my favorite native shrubs. Smells good. Birds like the berries, but the blooms, there's, yeah, there's a bloom. If you can see it here. I'm cutting to it right now. Yeah. All right. Also one of my favorites, Cephalanthus occidentalis. I didn't have much room for shrubs, so that didn't make it in here, but um, buttonbush attracts butterflies and small flying insects. Typically likes wet feet, um, but a lot of the cultivars can handle a little drier conditions. Clethra, Ulnifolia, summer sweet. Uh, this attracts hummingbirds, butterflies, bees, and more. Uh, when it was it, we had quite a stock of them uh, while they were in bloom this year, and the swallowtails just couldn't get enough of them, and bees too. Hypericum frond frondosum, St. John's wort, which I think I've already said in one of my webinars, but this is St. John's wort. Uh, I love that plant too. Good for the mid-season, it's a yellow bloom. Um, sunburst is the most common cultivar that we carry. Elix glabra, inkberry holly. Definitely one of those small blooms that attracts a lot of different species of bees. Uh, Rosa carolina, pasture rose and Rosa palustris, swamp rose. Um, attracts a lot of small pollinators. I see sweat bees on, on the blooms and other species of bees. And then also a new one for us this year is Spirea alba. Typically found a little north of here, um, but can handle our conditions okay. When you read about it, they typically say put it in full sun. I would place it more of a partial sun situation because we're so far south of its growing zone. Attracts a lot of small insects and skippers. Vines for summertime. Lonicerus and Provirens, Coral Honeysuckle, definitely a hummingbird favorite. Um, they're, they're, oh, here we go. Yeah, we've got one right here. It's in bloom. But when the, we have a lot of hummingbirds that reside at the Bates property. I call it, I call Bates kind of the Disneyland for pollinators. And this time of year, there's, we're entertained. Um, oh yeah, so much. <laughs> Especially this year. I've really, really gotten a lot more into this topic and really wanted to focus on it more and more. So I'm, I'm looking at caterpillars, finding their host plants, and trying to take in as much as I can. Perennials for mid-season. This is a big group. Yarrow, Achillea. Um, that's a great kind of flower structure for a lot of smaller pollinators. Agastache, Anis hyssop, um, Phoniculum. I always have a hard time saying that species. Uh, this is definitely a bee magnet. There's always bees on it. Uh, main cultivar we carry is Blue Fortune, Asclepius, Milkweed, the much talked about perennial. I got one right here. They're pretty much done blooming, but I grabbed one that had a little bit of a bloom. Sort of. Oh, the blooms fell off of that one. This one's about to bloom. It's Post got some plant. seeds on there too. Yeah. Yeah, host plant for the monarch, caterpillar, monarchs, great butterfly. And there's also, we also sell, that's tuberosa. We carry incarnata, um, cultivars of each, lots of options, um, plenty to choose from. Coreopsis. We carry a lot of different species of Coreopsis, attract small flying insects. Mount Cuba, uh, again, Mount Cuba trial, they did for Coreopsis, just a little, um, throw in that Coreopsis palustris summer sunshine was the best performer in, in their uh, trial. Echinacea, we've got Polita, or Pallida, Purpurea, and Tensinensis. Tennesseeensis, it's really hard to say. Uh, 
let's see, butterflies, bees, other insects, that is a very popular perennial right now outside. There's always, it's always covered in bees and swallowtails and skippers. Uh, Mount Cuba trial, their most recent trial was on echinacea, so it's kind of the most um, in depth. So they did specifically for best pollinator value and how many pollinators they attracted. Uh, top of the list was just straight seat species, purpurea, ruby star, Sombrero Baja Burgundy, Kesmet Raspberry, Magnus, Sombrero Blanco, Glowing Dream, Pow Wow White, and many more. Definitely look up their website and kind of dive deep and make your list. Um, as far as what we have here in Echinacea, this is Kesmet Raspberry. Yes, this is Ruby Star. There. And in the corner that's powwow white wait for it yep there we go <laughs> i think that's all the cone flower yep all right for the shade heucra americana and velosa those are our two native cultivar our native species um autumn bride is one of my favorites which is here it definitely gets the biggest ginormous leaves mine's probably about 30 inches wide right now maybe maybe wider um, and I didn't bring a caramel. Caramel's my other favorite one. Um, but right now we notice the hummingbirds love their blooms too, which is kind of, you wouldn't think that, uh, but they definitely go after those little blooms and other small insects love the blooms of coral bells. They're so tiny mm -hmm. in comparison to the other things yeah. you think. Yeah. You just wouldn't think that hummingbirds, which hummingbirds typically, when you look at the structure of blooms that they like, it's a tall stem with a lot of space for them to get to the bloom like they don't like this because they can't they can't flutter their wings and get to it <laughs> i'm glad i did that also for summer blooms helenium sneezeweed helianthus as a, there's a lot of different um, species within that genus which are sunflowers heliopsis smooth oxi we have several different types of that um, burning heart bleeding heart and then just straight species which we don't have straight species right now we're working on getting more in hibiscus or hardy hibiscus rose mallow that's a a good one for uh bees in particular i see a lot of bees going into those blooms liatris spicata that could almost be considered an early season it's right on the cusp also called gay feather um attracts bees and other small insects might attract hummingbirds it kind of falls into that group I don't see a whole lot on them though. Lobelia, it, cardinal flower. Is um, the liatris behind you or is that goldenrod? It is liatris. Woo! Yeah. So this is what it looks like after it blooms. It's a stalk. Um, and we leave it up because if we were to cut it back, there's not a whole lot going on at the base. And plus it allows for the plant to take, continue to take in nutrients throughout the season. Lobelia. <laughs> This one was a really late to the game. It's a young plant, so it didn't really follow its natural um, bloom time. Usually it is more summertime and it's, it's start, like this will be a bloom right here. Um, that is great for hummingbirds and other pollinators. There's also Lobelia syphilitica, which is the blue cardinal flower that typically I would put more in a part sun situation. And Lobelia, if it's gonna be in full sun needs to have some good moisture because it does like wet feet bee balm monarda i did bring that i like show and tell now that's that's something that just naturally screams to me like hummingbird magnet it is and i wanted to speak on that so hummingbirds not as a rule but as a preference like red when you think about all the native blooms in nature that hummingbirds go after it's bee balm cardinal flower um, red buckeye, coral honeysuckle, that's where they gravitate towards. Not that they'll go to other color blooms, but that's, they know that's a good source. Um, so, and not, not all reds, uh, attract pollinators. It's cause there's red cone flower. I mean, hummingbirds, but a lot of the reds will bring them to your yard and then they'll visit other flowers too. And flocks. There's lots of different species of flocks, paniculata, the varicata, as we talked about before, 
Um, arguably, Subulata is native. Not more towards the, like, Smoky Mountains, but it does fine here. Uh, my favorite, and to talk about Mount Cuba again, because I appreciate research. Um, this is Gina. Mm -hmm. Gina was found growing along the Harpeth River. So if you're wanting something locally native, you c can't really go more native than this. I mean, there's this the argument like, of straight species, but I understand. That's like backyard. Yeah. That's awesome. crazy. And the lady who discovered it, its name was Gina. No. Yep. True story. <laughs> <laughs> Tennessee original. Yeah, it is. Oh, speaking of Tennessee original, another, I don't know where this was discovered, but another really great, um, it's a naturally found hybrid. I think it, they finally pinned it as a Carolina, I don't remember the other species that it was bred with or naturally cross-pollinated, but mini pearl. I was going to spit that out eventually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mini pearl is a great uh, flocks. And hummingbirds will go after flocks. I see it from time to time. Not their favorite, but they will. Um, and this one, of all the flocks, Mount Cuba said this attracted the most pollinators. And that is absolutely true because when we have all the flocks outside, they gravitate towards this one. Um, one more thing about the color, purple. In general, when you think about purple blooming flower, native flowers, that's a preference for butterflies. They typically go after those colors first because that's what they're used to and that's the prevalent color. Um, just another side note. All right. Another less known we got for, well, we might've had it last year, Portoranthus or Bowman's Root. That's a good shade, airy, gets kind of big, white bloom, perennial. Pycnanthemum or Mountain Mint, didn't bring that in because I don't think it would fit in this room. Uh, attracts many different species of bees and butterflies. It's an absolute magnet for a lot of pollinators. When I, that, I underestimated how big that gets, yeah, too. Oh, yeah. That's another thing to just mention is give it space. Another one of those. Uh, it spreads, doesn't it? Um, eh, reseeds, too, I'm sure. But give it lots of space because it will. If you've got this area of your yard that you don't really do anything with, plop it in there it's like a wall <laughs> of spearmint foliage <laughs> yeah kind of that dusty silver color mm -hmm. all right rudbeckia tons of different types of rudbeckia i brought in this is little gold star stays short it's in that fulgita species and then um i don't know why but this is like i can't stop talking about this particular one uh little henry it's a subtomentosa rudbeckia i call it the mac and cheese plant it kind of looks like cheese. Uh, oh yeah, and then this giant gets up to six feet plus. There's a oh wow, a beetle it just, hanging on it just keeps oh. going. I don't think I can get that. There's tall. some beetles mating on it too. <laughs> Give them their space. No, uh, that's that is Lacinata stuff. <laughs> oh, there you go. There it is. It's uh -huh. all the Sorry. way up there. It's way <laughs> no, it's like it's a tall one. Yeah. That thing will hit its door on the way out for sure. <laughs> head. Hit yep, its head I on the... It <laughs> <laughs> I got what you're throwing down. Uh, that one is Lacionata Herbstone. Um, great. Again, give it lots of space. Put it towards the back of your perennial garden. Um, obviously attracts soldier beetles, which is what that was. Uh, and then the last... Or Maxima is another one. Um, not big showy blooms, but just excellent foliage. Uh, and the blooms, just like kind of, they're similar to that. They attract pollinators. And Herta, the last um, species, that's the kind of, I don't have one in here because we ran out, but we got more coming, is that bigger, like hairier bloom. Salvia. Uh, we have a native salvia. Is it really a, a far corner? There yeah. it is. Bing, bing. You can just see those are the like spent seed pods mm -hmm. um, developing some new blooms late in the season. So what um, what color is the bloom on that usually? Purple. Purple. And that one's called Purple Knockout. I think, don't quote me on it, but I think that was a naturally found, what you call it, species, some. Uh, okay. So we also, there's a lot of other salvias, but I'll talk about that in a second because really a lot more would fall into the annual category. Stokesia or Stokesaster, uh, two cultivars we sell, Peachy's Pink, 
Danube Blue, Verbena Canadensis, right here. Blooms a long time. Uh, great for a lot of different pollinators, including swallowtails and other butterflies. This is Homestead Purple. We also sell one called Kathy's Candy. Not reliably always perennial. Um, I hear things on both sides if it didn't come back or it came back with a vengeance. So I really don't know how to advise people because the stories are different. Uh, but it really, it's kind of zone, as far as the zone, just put it in a not, more protected spot um, and get it established in the spring as opposed to the winter or fall. And I'm oh. just going to go ahead and add, if you have any questions out there, feel free to comment them uh, and we can answer them towards the end of the webinar yes last one for mid-season um veronicastrum virginicum culver's root not a lot of people know about that one i wasn't able to bring that one inside um but definitely attracts a lot of butterflies and many other visitors um annuals i didn't bring any in uh there's a lantana outside because <laughs> there's no more space in here um but let's see we've got Coleus, I've seen hummingbirds go after coleus and other swallowtails. Pentas, petunias, kufia, or firecracker plant, and bat plant. Those are great for hummingbirds. Um, annual salvia. I, I planted a annual salvia, salvia coccinia, um, and it reseeded in one of my garden beds, and I love it. It's native more south of here. more So it's, it's an annual native um, but I definitely allow it to do its thing. And it's, it's easy to pull up if it gets out of control. Uh, zinnias, Cosmos, Lantana. So I, I like to use a lot of annuals and containers around the house because it kind of fills the gaps. As I build my perennial beds and as they get more full and more, more um, available for the pollinators, and it, it's just like when... My, so my Phlox Gina is just about done. I have a lot of things that are just about to start going. And so I've noticed the swallowtails are like, oh, you do have petunias or pentas. And so they're just kind of moseying around. And I plant salvia every year in containers for the hummingbirds, and they love it. Um, so there's a place definitely for annuals in your landscape as well. Late season, which is August, September, October. Trees, understory trees, most of them and shrubs are pretty much done blooming. They're busy producing fruit and seeds for uh, birds, so they're they're still doing a completing a function, but not necessarily for pollinators. They are um, shrubs. The only thing that blooms, I mean, I'm sure there's a few others, but of what we carry is Hamamelis virginiana, which is common witch hazel that blooms October December between that area and is pollinated by a moth that is still out and about. Perennials would include aster, which we've got aromatic aster here. This particular one is October Skies. There's also Radon's, it's Aromatic Aster, and there's also Radon's favorite, and we sell the straight species as well, which is a Belongifolius. Um, we also sell Purple Dome, which is a great compact aster. There's a lot more asters coming out on the market. Very excited about that, so we grab them when we see them. And this is the season for aster, so we will have plenty of asters. You said aromatic, so is it, is it more, does it smell strongly mm -hmm. more than the uh, average mm -hmm. aster? That's great. You can smell it later. Awesome. And one of the perks of working here at the yeah, nursery. Yeah, there's so many, like, <laughs> all of our senses are entertained, really. Mm -hmm. And you, it's, it's a perfect environment to learn if you kind of have an alternative learning style <laughs> and you just learn from all the senses. So, Chelone Glabra, here it is, Turtle Head. Definitely a fall bloomer. There's three main species um, that are either. Tennessee natives or regionally native. Leonii, and this one particular one is Leonii. Hot Lips is the cultivar. Uh, we also have Obliqua Tiny Tortuga that we sell, and just the white turtle head, which is Chelone Glabra. We've got a question coming in. Can, sure. you, can you recommend shade perennials for pollinators through the season? Yeah, so I've mentioned some of them, and I just... To... to and I'll, maybe I'll try to do that on the list of as I break down, I'll break it down even further of shade or sun. Um, but I've mentioned some of them. We've got coral bells and the ragworts one. Um, Portoranthus was one. 
there's more options than you think. And supp- a lot of the shrubs that I mentioned can do part sun or part shade to shade. So supplement your, per- your pollinator garden with those shrub blooms. Yeah. And a lot, and I didn't even mention early ephemerals like bloodroot and chi- uh, trillium, things in that category, because they're so hard to find uh, to be able to sell. They can be partic- kind of picky about where you put them. And those would typically be shade. And they, so they come out while the leaves aren't fully fleshed out, and then they go through their cycle, leaves flush out, and then they just kind of go dormant in the summertime. Um, red columbine is almost in that category, but it sticks around better and that's great a great one for the shade we've got little joe back here there are a lot of different cultivars of joe pie weed um they've even kind of changed the names of some of them this one is actually now eutrochium i'm sure i'm saying that wrong um they kind of vary in height uh we've we sell baby joe gateway phantom though we haven't had those two in a while Euphoria ruby is a new one that stays compact, three by three, because uh, some of the straight species will get giants, like eight, nine feet. So not everybody has room for that. And so we have dwarf cultivar options, still great value for pollinators. Their dwarf habit doesn't take away from pollinators other than there's less of the plant. Solidago, goldenrod, one of my favorite perennials. Yeah, this is golden fleece. You can't really see it. It's just about to bloom. Wow. Stays shorter. 24 to 36 inches is what I would say. I think the tag says even shorter. 24 inches. Um, Just depends on how happy it is, really. Uh, There's lots of options. Ragosa Fireworks is one. And Shorty Eye Solar Cascade is another one we carry. And Little Lemon. Um, It definitely attracts a lot of pollinators. And it's similar. Maybe the... I think that's right. Those soldier beetles, beetles typically prefer yellow blooms for, for doing their thing. Um, and that's, it's a sight to behold when all these are in bloom <laughs> on our property. Uh, another question coming in from Jack. Uh, would hosta be a pollinator plant? It is, yes. Yeah, and I didn't include, but yes, that it, it's bees love it. Hummingbirds are all over it at our nursery right now. Um, so that's a great one for shade. Not a native, fine. Um, because it's not, I mean, occasionally they put out seeds. It's not invasive. It's not a problem. Um, they're pretty. So that's a great one, too. Bada boom. Okay. Vernonia. And then we're done with me talking about the list of plants. Uh, Lettermanii is the species that we carry the most. Uh, Iron butterfly is a cultivar of that. And we have a new one this year, Summer Swan Song which is over here, and I will never be able to reach it. It's behind the ruby star. And it's just kind of finished on our, our property, um, but in the landscape and in, in the wild, they're definitely still full blooming, doing their thing. We're just getting started. Yes, just up in uh, towards Gallatin, there's fields of them in bloom right yeah. now. And speaking of nature's design that I mentioned earlier, that's such a great source for inspiration is just seeing what naturally grows together and blooms together or like in the fall season there's vernonia goldenrod asters um and those colors look great together i think um nature kind of has a good taste in color okay so that wraps up the lists of early mid and late season blooms um little a little more information for you. Um, rest assured, there is a ton to choose from. And like we said, this is going to be posted so you can go back and reference everything that I just divulged and we'll have a, a list for you um, to look through. You don't need to have a detailed plan and get everything down to a science when it comes to planting for pollinators. Just keep introducing more to your landscape, more diversity, more things that bloom at different times. And what I ask of you the most is that you stop and observe. My yard is my research center. I am constantly outside trying to take in and observe as much information as possible. You can read as many books about nature as you would like, and I try, but if we are not outside connecting with nature, I think we're really missing the mark. Um, Just a little story of this year in my garden. I now have 13 milkweed, 
Asclepius, different species, planted in my yard. Milkweed, of course, is the host plant for the monarch caterpillars. It also plays host to 10 other species of Lepidoptera. This summer, these plants truly came alive and they taught me some valuable lessons. First, I watched the milkweed tussock moth caterpillars in fuzzy droves. I checked on them every day. They stayed together in groups at first, but as they developed, they courageously ventured out on their own. Then the large milkweed beetles started to appear. Then the aphids showed up in mass. And I had made the decision this year that I would just allow the aphids to exist on the plants because I wanted to observe the predators that would come. And they did. Uh, lady beetle eggs and gray sli- gr- green lace wing eggs appeared on the undersides of leaves. Then they hatched into their pupal stage, both species chomping down on their little orange treats. Signs of parasitic wasps were everywhere as more aphids turned into brown mummies. Today, the aphids are almost entirely gone, and there are countless species that thrived because because of my decision to let nature take its course. The more you watch these visitors in your gardens, the more you will develop a deeper appreciation for their presence and purpose. The more you know about them, the more you will care about them. And they desperately need us to see them and to care about their futures, because the reality is that their futures and our futures are connected. We need them just as much as they need us. And the last thing that I would like to add, just to kind of bring it all together of past webinars, this webinar, is that um, planting blooms for our pollinators invites them into our outdoor spaces. But another big piece of, to the puzzle, and something I have said before, is also supplying them with their host plants. I have three Lindera, Benzuin, or Spicebush in my yard. This year is the first year I have seen the spicebush caterpillars foraging on the leaves, and I 100% accredit all of the perennial flowers I have installed in the past year to why there are so many caterpillars. The flowers brought them into my yard. The spicebush invited them to stay. So that is it. Do we have any other questions? Or Tyler, would you like to offer any words of wisdom? Uh... Well, when I when I first got my house, there was already an established garden, and I think it was mostly things that were that were not native, but they were blooming. But I said, "Well, how do I know what's all here?" And then the owner just said, "Well, just observe through the year as the year progresses." And as I did, I I noticed that there was kind of a cascade to things that. Uh, you know, the, the roses would come out and bloom. And then later on in the, um, in the summer, you get the tiger lilies that were blooming, the day lilies that were blooming, balloon flower. And so things mm-hmm. just kind of started to show itself. And then you, you observe, oh, well, you know, this autumn joy sedum is attracting a lot of bees and, 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 and tiny bees and big bees and stuff like that. And then you're like, oh man, this, this puzzle is being put together for me right before my eyes. And so you, I mean, I think it's excellent that you did the like time of season that it does bloom because I think that is if it's almost like rolling out a red carpet for them, mm-hmm. and it's just like keep it going, yeah. you know? Yeah, and you really get to witness how many different things visit at different times. Exactly. Uh, so it's remarkable. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in at the moment, so uh, feel free to comment them out if you want to. Uh, we've- okay. I, I, maybe I have one more thing to say. Sure, go ahead. Uh, I just want to like clarify a little bit. Like, I'm not. Um, I see my. I'm very passionate about natives, um, so I've. I see that as my um, niche, sort of. Uh, I just. I see the value of them. How much additional ecosystem function that they um, offer for our environment. Um, but I'm definitely. I mean, I work here at Bates. And we, there, there are other pollinator options, just like hosta and sedum autumn joy, um, to offer the pollinators as well. Uh, and there's, there's really, though there are specialist things for cert, like specialist bees with the pollen. Uh, overall, in general, nectar's nectar, pollen's pollen, and it's, it helps the pollinators. So I wanted to throw that out there too, that like, they're good. They, they offer the non-native flowering plants offer things as well for pollinators. Yeah. But just like you were saying, inviting them to stay requires a host plant. Right. Right. To keep those generations going, we need more natives in our landscape. 
Yes, and it's it's beautifully said. Uh, I'm not I'm not seeing any other questions. Oh, so. I'm sorry. Huh? I'm sorry. You get Hold something on. else. I almost forgot about Rita. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> this has been such a great resource for me as I've been learning more and more about butterflies in particular because that's what she focuses on. This is Rita Venable, Butterflies of Tennessee. I highly recommend you get this book as you're learning more. Sorry, the camera's right here. I keep looking at the other camera. Um, as you're learning more about butterflies, there's other resources out there too. Um, books on moths, uh, beetles, that kind of thing. So there's lots of resources out there, but this is a great book. And she did such a great job because she, she goes into where you'll find them, their habitat, where they shelter, um, their host plants. It's a great resource. I've dropped a link there in the comments. Oh, thank you. So it goes straight to her website. She's awesome. All right. Well, uh, it seems like uh, no other questions so far. So if you want to okay. go ahead and wrap up. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today, Bates Botanical Boot Camp. You can check out other um, webinars that we've had on our YouTube channel or on our um, website. Um, great information is out there for you to look into. So thank you very much. I hope you guys have a good day and stay dry. Mm -hmm.